Welcome to the Financial Planners Southeast Asia Podcast, a show dedicated to driving the positive evolution of financial advice, specifically within Southeast Asia. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. It's another day here in the Financial Planners Southeast Asia podcast with me, Gwen. And today I am with a particularly amazing financial advisor. He is an award winning financial advisor from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I am with Next Gen Money Coach Kevin Neo. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Hi, Gwen. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs> oh, no problem. I'm, this is actually one of the. My, the highlights for this quarter's podcast series because I've uh, really wanted to speak with you for a very long time and so I've uh, I now have the opportunity as well as the platform to do it so um, Kevin is um, as I mentioned earlier is a is an award-winning financial advisor in, based in um, Kuala Lumpur Malaysia but aside from that he's also a really great champion um, for the XY advisor and the XY advisor cause. And you will know that later on as we talk about how Kevin does his practice and like the, the things that he does in an everyday basis in order to um, help his clients. So Kevin, just to start off, I, I know that you've been in the industry for 13 years, for almost 13 years, right? And I actually read like your bio and did a little bit of digging. So, but, but first, before I, I, I get into that nitty gritty stuff. So you've been an advisor since 2008, right? Yes, you are right. So yeah. time really flies. <laughs> this, is, yes. this year, 2021 will be year 13. Exactly yes. one tree, yeah. Yes, lucky number 13. But before you became a financial advisor, you actually studied and got a, deg a degree in biochemistry. So what made you shift um, from a totally different like career path to becoming a financial advisor? <laughs> well, this is a interesting story, but I guess mm -hmm. I'm not the unique person because I... I do think that there are many other people who actually came across similar journey like mine. So what happened was I was really like without a direction or real goal back then when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. So I just followed whatever is hot at that point of time, which is to uh, involve yourself in a degree in science. Mm -hmm. And I applied for a degree in biochemistry, which I was lucky enough to be offered that and I took mm -hmm. it. So about uh, six months before the graduation, I like everybody else, I had to start thinking about, oh my God, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And that's, that's the point that I it, 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 it stumbled upon me that I must do something I find meaningful with the rest of my life. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be worth living at all. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like searching a little bit. And there was one day I went to a career fair. Mm -hmm. However, I was a, uh, and, and during, at, at the career fair there, I was approached by someone who asked me this uh, life-changing uh, question that is a uh, uh, do you want to understand about financial planning? <laughs> so oh. this is the catchphrase that got my attention. And because it, I can actually say that it's the first time I hear this phrase, financial planning. And uh, it also tie back to my childhood and my upbringings. I have to say that I came from a family that we are not rich, but mm. we are not exactly uh, the, the very poor family. But yeah. one thing for that stood out is that uh, my family, we don't really have a good awareness as far as financial planning and managing yeah. our personal finance is concerned. So mm. I can relate to that. I think this is important. So I did some Google searches back then. It was in 20, 2008. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. found that uh, in other countries, not in Malaysia yet, financial planner, the role is actually very important because mm. we kind of like help people, kind of like the doctor, but we treat 
money problems yeah. which and, and money problem does eventually impact other areas of our life so yeah. that makes it very important and very meaningful and that's when i decided okay i want to become a financial planner so that's how i got into this profession amazing this is actually a very interesting story and uh, i also can really relate to that and i know that like i think most of the people uh, financial advisors that i've interviewed had that similar thing as well that urge to to make a difference in other people's lives yeah i guess so so uh, like, like i say i'm not the only one who yeah. who had gone through this and i'm glad to know that uh there are many others who share the same uh, belief like me because uh, this journey is at the beginning especially is going to be a, a little bit challenging and mm. because uh, especially at that point of time here if you want to become a financial planner there was no clear path for me and so i i went back to the person who asked me this question so he told me that yeah. <clears throat> there's a few phases of uh financial planning and mm. the, one of it is to protect your wealth so you mm. should start from uh, the very basic which is wealth protection so that was the time that i came to know he was a uh, agency uh manager from a life insurance company mm. and he was actually do, doing his recruitment talk to me when he asked me the question so from here uh because i couldn't i searched around and i didn't find any way that about how to be a financial planner so i took the leap yeah. of faith so i mm-hmm. thought uh insurance is quite important as well in fact mm-hmm. before i met this person i always thought that life insurance is like a scam <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that that was how immature i am as far <laughs> as financial literacy is concerned mm-hmm. Yeah, but but I I let myself to have an open mind, and I have I went through the exposure, understand a little bit more, and then I think life insurance is actually very important. And if I could stay as a life insurance consultant for a few years, it really means that I'm serious about being a financial planner. So mm. that's when I said, okay, let's do this. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And yes, I actually agree. When when we were when I was young, um even my parents um would tell me that don't ever get insurance. It's it's a scam. <laughs> you can't get any money at the end of it. <laughs> and and that's what we're also trying to change, right? To to change other yeah. people's opinion about um how insurance work and how important financial planning is, financial literacy. And and that's what um it got me very interested um Kevin because it seems like we do have similar uh, similarities in how the our financial advice system works here in the Philippines and there in Australia as well uh, I'm sorry in Malaysia as well but can you tell me like what is the um like how do you describe the financial advice structure in, in your in your in your country does it start as do you have to start as being an insurance um advisor first uh maybe i cannot speak on behalf of the whole industry or the whole yeah. profession yeah. but i'll mm-hmm. share based on what i think Uh, okay. So over here, to become a financial advisor or a licensed financial planner, we, mm-hmm. uh, the candidate has to apply the relevant license from our central bank as well as Security Commission of Malaysia. So one mm-hmm. of the criteria to apply for the license is that this person must possess a professional qualification. Uh, for example, the CFP certification. So this person has to be certified uh, as a CFP holder. Then mm-hmm. for few other con. conditions like you pass the fit and proper test and then uh, you don't have money issue yourself and then oh. then you may get approved for the license to practice so with that uh-huh. license uh, the the candidate can can now practice financial planning and offer financial advice through mm. a principal company mm. all right That's but before before we enroll for the CFP course for example mm. mm-hmm. the candidate must also possess uh, experiences in the relevant industry so for instance it can be like as a life insurance uh, consultant uh, mm. a mutual funds consultant or you work in a bank so long it's related to finance then you can actually enroll for that you sit for the exams there are a few modules and once you pass the modules and you fulfill the the requirement to be approved uh as a certified member by the FPA Malaysia mm-hmm. then you'll be uh granted the CFP certificate 
Oh, that's interesting. All right. So it, it does um, have a little bit of similarity here in the Philippines, but I think that your um, the structure in Malaysia is more controlled um, because you actually have to um, practice what you preach. So you have to have like good <laughs> financial standing. Um, and I don't think that we have that yet, yet. So that's one of the, I think, uh, and the reason why I ask you is because I, I we really want to see like the, what are the best practices for each countries, right? And what we can do to improve our own. So that's very, that's, I think that's very interesting. <laughs> and, In fact, we have to submit our personal credit report. Mm. our credit repayment history and habit because uh, it, and if this person have for example have missed payment to mm. service his his or her loans account in the yeah. past uh, then that will create some hiccup along the journey of uh, getting license ah oh, interesting all right okay and you have to maintain that good like financial credibility all throughout your career um, our licenses require us to renew it every year and mm. every year we have to we have a, a, a checklist to that we have to submit for the renewal application oh i see i see so yes that is that is actually um something that is a really good practice it's that you have to update like the the control group or, or the control body with yes. the, yeah, we, the call them, status. we call them regulators the regulators yes so yes. with regards to the status of like your finances and um your especially with how updated you are with with the policies in your in your country as well all right oh yeah of course we, we have to fulfill the continuous professional development cpds mm. This, oh, I think yes, this one yes. is a standard it's, across the world, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, cool. And also, because that is a... So so in Malaysia, it is a very controlled um, career. Um, are there, like, a lot of financial advisors that are out there who or are, like, really certified financial um, advisors out there? Or are still is this still, like a, like, a niche profession? Like not everyone ha uh, really has been there for like the long haul. Okay, maybe the best way to describe this is that this is a sunrise profession and mm. there's a lot of opportunity as far as uh, having new people joining the profession mm. is concerned. So uh, we have two regulators here. Bank Negara Malaysia, or we call it Central Bank of Malaysia. Yeah. This is the body that uh, regulate the license related to financial advisory uh, activity, which mm. is it means uh, the person who has this license is allowed to analyze the financial situation of the, the other person and provide recommendation mm. in respect to insurance is concerned. And then the other body is the Security Commission of Malaysia. Mm. This license allows the person to analyze the financial situation of the other person and provide recommendation and a financial plan uh, with regards to uh, securities like, you know, the mutual funds, mm, uh, yes. REITs, ETF, uh, other bonds, fixed income mm. instruments. Mm, so okay. we need to have uh, multiple licenses in order to provide a really full-fledged financial planning service. Yeah, yeah. And that entails you having to go through modules and um, learning sessions for that one, right? And um, I know that you also have, because you have are a very controlled body or a sector, you also have the Malaysian Financial Planner of, of the Year Awards and you've won yeah. twice. And now you're in the, um, is that the board or a judge panel? Uh, what I know is that this is an award, uh, actually, how to say, created mm. by the FPA mm. uh, Malaysia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose of this award is to recognize the work of uh, financial planners who really practice financial planning and mm. to, pro uh, to uh, construct a real financial plan for a real life client. Mm. So there are, there are there's a panel of judges. 
I think about five judges mm -hmm. that actually came from different areas or different region or country around the world. As far as I know, that there, there were judges from Canada, judges oh. from Malaysia, mm -hmm. Australia also, Hong Kong, if not mistaken. So, oh, so, so, so yeah, about like two or three years ago, I was invited. I was lucky enough to be invited to join the panel of judges. Oh, so I, I just gladly say yes to that. <laughs> yes. All right, and I I realize that you're one of those people who are really go getters. Like yes, yes to new opportunities. But I'm curious because you won the fi Malaysian Financial Planner of the Year award twice how does mm -hmm. one become a malaysian financial planner of the year awardee like what were your best practices that you think have um have garnered you that award it's a very good question to ask and uh, you got me thinking about that <laughs> but i guess to 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 summarize this is I guess you, the financial planner just have to really preach what they say they do and put the clients at the core of the whole process and treat the client right. And then I guess eventually your work will be recognized and then uh, and then you will eventually receive some uh, applause from your peers and mm. even from other people. I guess it will naturally come to you. Right. So, and so how the award work is that uh, we, were, we were required to, to, to submit a plan that we done for a real life clients. Of course, we had oh. to ask the clients if they agreed for us to submit the plan. To disclose, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, we do, uh, we, 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 we track their, we redact their, their names and their sensitive yeah. information. Mm -hmm. So the judges will go through the plan. They will also discuss about whether the plans did address the issue, the, the objective and the goals of the client. Mm -hmm. And then they will go through different, different areas. For instance, retirement planning, tax planning, estate planning, and they will give points or marks according to how, how they think the planners mm -hmm. have done in the plan that address these different respective areas in the plan. So I think eventually the person with the highest marks on average will be the winner and then subsequently mm. the runner up the second runner up. Mm, right and and that is basing from the judges that have come from all around the world as well um, because I initially thought that the the panel is just like all of them are Malaysians. So they're really from other countries that had um, background in different types of financial planning uh, based in their country. Yes, you're right. And, and this is also one of the key, key points that actually help us to grow because by have, getting feedback from judges who are from different backgrounds, different yes. uh different how to say different experiences and cultures mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. allows us to have different perspective and then we will think about how can i incorporate this suggestion into my process how to improve mm -hmm. on the plans and eventually this is i think how we can improve the profession has to improve from incorporating good ideas from around the world yeah yeah definitely right and i i think that we can really learn a lot from from other countries as well especially the progressive ones and the ones that already had the financial um, advice industry in place for a much longer time than mm. than we have and so from from being the fi malaysian Pl financial planner of the year award i know that this is also because you have called yourself a life centered financial planner now why do you call yourself a life centered financial planner because this is actually the first time that i've read i've heard someone coin their themselves that so why do you call yourself that? Okay, actually, the, the term uh, life center financial planner, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to say that it has no relationship with the awards. I came mm -hmm. across this term, if I'm not mistaken, it would be in the year of 2020. It's ah, actually just a new one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually uh, from these two person, Mitch Anthony in the US and Paul, mm -hmm. Paul Armson in the UK. They are the two person who really started an evolution of life center financial planning. Oh. And, and I came across this uh, concept and I, 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 I have to say that even though I just came across this term last year, 
in a way, the the way I, the, the process that I gone through with the clients mm. is seem it somehow is a little bit in the same direction because I believe that we do all the planning is for the client and therefore the plan must actually uh, recognize that the the main character is the clients it's not their money mm. and so uh, that's how i work with the clients is to discuss a lot more on their their concerns their fear their aspirations mm. and also their personal values what's important to them and if mm. there's anything in their life that they would like to uh, change or improve today mm. not like wait until they retire yeah. 30 years from now mm. yeah so that's that's when i came across this term and i realized that actually in around the world there are a lot of practitioners who are mm. actually adopting the life-centered uh, approach to financial mm. planning and that's how i started to describe myself as such as well all right right so that's I'm really very interested in this conversation because I didn't know that um, there were a lot of people now who are practicing life-centered financial planning, and that's I think I'm, I really need to Google that. <laughs> uh, I but think last year, last year they did came up with a very important book. It's uh, the title of the book is Life-Centered Financial Planning. How hmm. to deliver value that would never be undervalued. Ah, that's a good title. And and it's so you've catchy, been practicing it? it. Yes, it is, it is. And um I think it's a it would be a very good read. I think um I would be you know, picking up that book soon. And because you've you've adapted the the life centered financial um planning um concept do you still have like a, a particular demographic uh, for your client base or are you open to all like generations? Oh, I, I, I found myself typically working with clients who are from the age band of like 30 to 40 years old mm-hmm. and um, apparently most of them are also working professional and mm. a, a, a majority of them are also parents of children. Mm, okay. So, like us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like myself. Right? So, I, I find that it's easier for me to relate to the clients. Yes, I guess. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Um, because it, it, it's easier for us to to relate to them because we're also in, in that age group, in, in the same... Mm-hmm like situation that we have kids and and all that stuff but so that's how you did is that how you were able to niche on that particular client base um did you really think that through or did it just happen that like most of the clients that you've attracted are on like on your in their 30s 40s working professionals Initially, uh, I hit a lot of walls <laughs> mm. because uh, it's new and uh, we, we, uh, I didn't really have a mentor to guide me. So mm. I tried multiple things, multiple times, and then I realized that uh, it's good to try and hit walls sometimes. Anyway, yes. yeah, uh, if we never try to hit some walls, we'll never find new approaches or new ways to do things, right? So what happened yeah. was uh, when I first got licensed, I was very uh, excited. <laughs> so yeah. I talked course, to yes. anyone about financial planning and eventually mm. I realized that you cannot talk to anyone because sometimes you speak mm. to the wrong person about uh, financial planning. If this person yes. is not... They, they do not need this or they do not mm. have a need to even talk about this, then mm. we will put ourselves in a very disappointing scenario all the time. Oh, yes, so, yes. yeah. So, I think it's fair that I had to try to ask myself who will be people or person who will actually appreciate having a conversation about financial planning. And mm. I realized that maybe it's easier if I speak to people who are about uh, my same age group because mm. one thing is at least I know what they don't like <laughs> and then yes. I will also be able to relate more to what kind of struggle they may face and what mm. are the things that they want to do so I guess the conversation will be easier so that's mm. how I started to think about that and then 
uh, of course, we have to also do some marketing uh, effort, right, to attract people, to yes. let people know that, yes. uh, hey, uh, this person called Kevin exists and this is what he does. So I try to, that's what I need, I try to do back then. I actually uh, wrote an emails to some magazines, some publication to introduce mm-hmm. myself. Oh, and yes. that's how I got some opportunity to answer some question from their readers and mm. from there it just things just happen by itself and then uh, I started to have some more platforms to to share sure, about my yeah. philosophy about what I think about knowledge on personal finance and that's how I guess uh, people uh, potential clients are attra- uh, started to come making their inquiries right so way way to go on getting that initiative to really contact magazines and that really worked out for you and i think that's a really good way to put yourself out there right and which is actually a really good segue for uh, my next question because what i really love about you and how you manage your your practice is that you love putting content out there you've got you've got a blog you constantly post in social media and now recently you have a podcast so how has creating all of these like content and putting them out there how has it helped you um, grow your business especially now uh, during the the pandemic period that's a great question thank you for asking me that grant yeah uh, sure as far as uh, creating contents is concerned uh, i have to say that I, I enjoy doing this not because i have too much time but simply because uh, i believe that the people in my country especially mm. The level of financial literacy, we, we still have a huge room for improvement. So we need someone who, who really wants to share something. And since I have learned all this and I'm in the business of uh, doing financial planning. So yeah. if I could, why not I share what I know? At, at least uh, I may be able to help people to make a more sensible decision with their money mm-hmm. and also potentially help them to avoid making some expensive uh, lessons. Mistakes, yeah. Mm. Uh, lessons, mistakes. Uh, lessons, yes. Yeah. Actually, lessons is a better word. <laughs> yeah, so to help them to avoid uh, some expensive lessons because mm. I, I believe that we all have a fi- life that is finite. But yes. uh, our... So that, that means every second and every hour of our life is very valuable. But if we make some... Uh, we, we travel towards certain direction and eventually only realize we have not been on the right track then we have wasted a lot of time and sometimes we cannot even really uh, make a reverse turn mm-hmm. because we, we don't really know how much time we have left in ourselves so so that's one of the motivation that I thought is if I could if I have been given this opportunity uh, why not I just mm-hmm. share what I know so I share about topics like uh, about life insurance, about mm. medical insurance, about uh, diversification in investment, about um, spend within your means, uh, save first, pay yourself first. So I share all these contents and eventually I realized that not everyone likes to read and sometimes mm. people read the beginning and they may have yes. missed out important disclaimer or yeah. important uh, contents at the at the end of the article so maybe yeah. we should also try other approaches so that's how like video comes into the picture especially during the mm. pandemic we have not been able to see each other so having yes. the video presence i reckon is quite important and also interesting because it allows us to to feel uh, a little bit like closer to each other yes yes definitely definitely and um and and that's why you um, got into making and creating videos because you do post videos um, on on your um, social media, and I, I definitely agree that especially during the pandemic, um, video it has been such a crucial way for us to feel like we're closer to to another person because nothing beats like looking um, yeah. <laughs> looking at a person um, and 
I guess because it's easier to consume video now, right? Um, then uh, I know that definitely some people prefer just watching someone rather than like reading an article. Like it, it just evolved. So the, the evolution of social media and how we consume information has changed as well. Now, and because you're busy, like how do you find the time to like – create the content and then actually like do the video or write up a blog like how do you manage your time on that do you block like one or two hours or a day or do you have like one whole day of just creating um, your social media content like, how do you manage that i i didn't really plan or structure it that way uh as far as uh, posting into social media is concerned it's actually a little bit like ad hoc so uh. Uh, sometimes idea just flash by or sometimes something just happened in, during the day and then mm. I just thought in the way that relate it to financial planning or personal finance mm. and I just created some posting. And from there, in some, some topic may be expanded into like, if it's worth talking more, then maybe mm. it can actually become an article and also become a video and etc. All right. So I like that approach, a very organic one. So whatever you you think about that oh, this is good and especially if that um, particular post or particular uh, comment or video gets a lot of views then I guess it's it's something that you want to delve more deeper into and that becomes um, an article for your blog. All right. Yeah. Now, because you've been very busy for for uh, because I know you from last year when you started in <laughs> XY Advisor, um, so, and you've been very busy. You've been very active and um, uh, posting all this social media content. And I know you have like work and working with clients um, aside from that. So, what are your plans for your business um, this year, twenty twenty one? Wow! Thank you for asking such a big question. <laughs> 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 Luckily for me, yeah. I have I have some answers for that. Yes, <laughs> they're really cool. in the planning business, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. So what, happened, what happened was actually the pandemic has actually also shown me, uh, have helped me to think of things in another perspective, in mm. which uh, I noticed that a lot of people, uh, they are actually quite fragile as far as their money management is concerned. Mm, and yes. this whole pandemic actually revealed a lot of uh, potential time bomb that people are carrying around. Mm. And what I noticed is that um, maybe it will be quite meaningful and also mm. uh, spiritually satisfying for me to mm. if I were able to help people who have not been able to save money or have been having trouble with managing their cash flow to, to see improvement. So moving forward, I would like to consciously introduce the coaching element into my service and help people mm. to be more accountable into their, their goals and also how they manage their money and live their life. So mm. that's one of the, the, the major direction that I want to focus in. Oh, that's very nice. And um, I really think that more people should try to do that, um, especially like, is that something that's more common, a uh, more common practice in Malaysia? Or do you know a lot of people who are already doing that as well? Maybe, maybe some of us, we have been doing this, like, mm. not consciously. But uh -huh. also a very yeah. few, uh, a very few people that whom I, I know peers, uh, peers that I know, they are actually providing this kind of service. But it's not really like we have an additional item in our service menu that says financial coaching. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, I think no one really offers that yet. So that's how I try mm -hmm. to uh, incorporate this, and also largely because in our country. Uh, financial planning services, you can actually largely break it down to three uh, practice model, which is uh, commission only, fee based, and fee only. And oh, yes, the, yes. The, the idea that I have for my coaching service is that I would like it to be a flat fee model if it's possible. Uh, that, that's what I'm working towards too. All right. All right. So, yes, I definitely 
more power to you on that. And I hope that it w works well. Um, I'm actually excited to interview you in the future to see how how that business, new business model that you're trying to integrate with work, um, has been working for you. So I hope that I can invite you again soon here in the podcast. Sure. So, but, I, but if I may, I, I can actually share with you that I, I wrote this out late last year and I'm just seeing some good momentum in mm. that. I actually mm. have a name for the program also. It's called Money Transformation Program. The ah. whole idea is to transform the relationship we have with our money, money so that yes. we can mm. yeah, really be the master instead of being, the, being mastered by it. Yes, being the slaves or of our yeah. own money because it's not supposed to be that way. And that's really good because I think that it's the same here in the Philippines. We already have this mentality that we have let money control us um, with with how we think and how we even run our day, um, mm. how we work, right? So it's uh, it would be really refreshing to learn that it shouldn't be the case at all. Um, we can still be happy and yes. at the same time be financially stable without having to like work long, very long hours and be very unhappy for a certain period of time before we can be very um, we can like reap the fruits of our for of our labor just with the right type of financial planning. All right. Now nice, I don't want to. Nice I don't want to keep you. Yes, thank you. And I, I don't want to keep you in the for for long. I know I promised it, this to be a not so long podcast. So my last question for you, Kevin, is that um, I'd like to know what is what are the best lessons that you've learned from working in this industry for more than a decade so that our um, fellow listeners, because I'm actually, um, I also want to target um, new and upcoming financial advisors to come and join the bag, uh, bandwagon of ethical financial, uh, financial planning. So what are those best practices that maybe that you can share with us? Maybe the biggest one I would say is, I, I would suggest is to, uh, to tr sometimes we have to trust our own instinct and we must mm -hmm. understand what, uh, what, what we want from our own professional career. Uh, do, not, mm -hmm. do not just listen to people who tell you what you should do, but instead yeah. put more effort put more energy to think about what you really want for yourself and then mm -hmm. you just make sure if there's any challenges, think towards the more constructive uh, spectrum, find ways mm -hmm. to minimize or remove the barriers instead of letting those barriers and challenges become the reason that we have to change our direction or to not mm -hmm. proceed to move forward. Wow, such excellent, excellent advice. And I'm sure that a lot of financial advisors out there, even, even the seasoned ones, would benefit from that. So thank you so much, Kevin. I've, I've actually learned a lot. I know I have to google a lot of things now so thank you so much for being on the show and i hope to chat with you really soon and to um check base on on how your money transformation has has gone after like let's say by next year why don't sure. we do that sure sure All right <laughs> okay yeah. thank you so and much thank Kevin. you for hosting me again gwen ah uh, no problem it is my pleasure it is my pleasure you have a good one same, same to you. Take care and be safe. Thank you. You too. You too, Kevin. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.